we do have uh, two speakers this evening. Uh, we'll start with um, Tim Alderton. Uh, Tim uh, comes to the Arboretum March 2006. January 2006. Uh, Denny, one of Denny's first hires. Um, Tim is a, a, a graduate of Penn State, uh, a native of Penn State, and worked at Plants Delight before uh, we attracted him away from there. Uh, our other speaker is uh, Chris Glenn. Chris uh, Glenn was uh, a graduate student in the Horticultural Science Department. Uh, Frank Lazich and Stu Warren uh, were his major professors, and Chris was hired fall 1999 about Thanksgiving. And um, I thought it was going to be who's on first and what's on second. But what I understand is that was had, too easy. We got a co-mingled yeah. presentation this evening. So great gardens and nature sites in Vancouver and Victoria, British Columbia. I'm thrilled. Okay. We'll see if we can pull it off. Yeah. We have merged a lot of things. And we haven't practiced this, so. <laughs> so I have 1,600 slides to show you, and Tim has 2,700 slides to show you, something like that. Is that what we did? <laughs> So we actually aired it down from there, so don't be too scared. But this is going to be about our recent trip over to British Columbia. We visited Vancouver and Victoria uh, in August, and we had quite a few people here. And I'm going to turn the light on real fast. Sorry about that. Because we have several of our people that were on the trip. So go ahead and stand up, raise your hand, do whatever. Let them know that you were on the trip with us so they can uh, ask questions for you. Thank you very much for going with us. I hope you guys had a good time. I know I certainly did. And uh, let's go ahead and see what we did on this trip, because we certainly had a lot of fun. Uh, a day, first day was uh, September, you know what? August. 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 Whenever you see September, <laughs> just change it to August. I didn't make these slides. Like that. <laughs> That's what dyslexia does every once in a while, unfortunately. Hey, it seems like it was about a month ago, wasn't it? Yeah, time does fly. But we were up very, very early in the morning, and uh, we had a professional traveler in our group, and his name, of course, is Mark, because he travels quite a bit and does a lot of plant collecting. So he was the only one that was prepared to actually take a nap on the plane. Uh, our plane took off at 6 a.m. in the morning. Uh, unfortunately, that was my decision to make that flight. I did not like it. My alarm clock rang at 3 o'clock in the morning, and oh, that was awful. But since we got out so early, we were able to do a lot of wonderful things when we got to uh, British Columbia. And our first destination, well, let me just say, the first day was actually a day that all the participants could go out on their own and enjoy the city if they wanted to do that. They all chose to go with us, which was wonderful because we visited some great spots. Our first destination was Capilano Suspension Bridge Park. You could tell, of course, what they had there was a great suspension bridge, but they had a lot of other things to offer. When we first got in, they had a wonderful totem park. And uh, the totem poles were added in 1930, so they have been there for quite a while. But that was a great way to greet us as we entered the park. There's the namesake of the actual park. That was a huge bridge. Uh, I kind of got a laugh out of that when we got there because it said, don't shake the bridge. It didn't matter if you shook that bridge because it just moved everywhere as we were on it. I wish I took a video of it. I but did. that is, oh, you did take a video? You should have told me, Tim. We'd have incorporated in there. There's Gail right there. This is a very old bridge. This uh, bridge dates back to uh, 1889, so it's been there for quite a while. It's 450 feet long. It's 230 feet above the, uh, above the water, and it can support a lot of people on that bridge. It looks like a lot of people, but it can support 1,300 people. And just in case you measure things in elephants, it can also support 96 elephants, uh, according to their literature, which I thought was awfully cute. And that's the actual river below it, and it was quite stunning. I was awfully jealous on the opposite side of the river was a lovely uh, group of condos or townhomes or apartments that overlook the gorge, and that must be an awesome view from over there. But on the far right, Tim, if you want to point to it, that's uh, the cliff walk that we'll show in just a moment. See that little people up there on the little cliff walk? Uh, the treetop adventure was a lot of fun, kind of reminded me of being an Ewok village, but you're up inside the trees, up inside these uh, um, uh, bridges and canopies, so you're kind of up at a squirrel's eye view of the trees, which is quite amazing. You don't get an experience like that very often. And uh, according to them, those are not bolted into the trees. They actually use a pressure system or a compression system to hold themselves onto the trees. 
Um, they must be able to handle a lot of weight because there's a whole lot of people there. If you wind up going there, don't go on a weekend like we did. Go on a weekday. Uh, but there was a series of seven different bridges, and as you went, we got higher and higher up into the trees and then kind of lower down. It was a great view of the trees. Uh, uh, a variety of trees, mostly I think Douglas fir, and there might have been some uh, western red cedar yeah. or uh, Fuja placata. Um, and these were all old growth trees. I believe they said some of their trees were over a thousand years old in that park. Uh, this here is the cliff walk, which was uh, a, quite an amazing feat that they installed. Um, let me see right here. Yep. This whole entire structure, not just this part, but a much longer part, all told, was connected to the cliff with six, 16 different anchor points. So that was quite impressive. But it was a series of uh, uh, different bridges, stairs, and platforms. It is definitely not handicap accessible, unfortunately, but wow, was that a fantastic view. That was my favorite part right there. Really got out over everything. But uh, that was something. I was shaking as I went through it. No, no, I wasn't. And then this is some of the bases of the trees for uh, uh, Rosa, uh, Rosalind. This is uh, for scale. These are probably Douglas fir right here. So uh, Pseudosuga menziesii, which we were saying about the uh, old growth. And this is some of it there. Those are probably babies too, right? Yeah, I don't think they're extreme. They're, I don't know if these are truly old growth, but these are big trees. Yeah, they were like six, eight feet across. And you put, when you're done, Tim. More. Let's see. I'm clicking. Is it up to me now? It might be up to you. Okay. I can use the laser. We'll wait for that to finish if it's so loud. Didn't space anticipate it being that loud, sorry about that. But this, as you can tell, was Cypress Falls Park. This is our second destination that day. And this was just kind of a county or a city park that we visited. It was just a, a, a nice path that uh, walked along a stream. And as we walked the stream, we walked past a couple of waterfalls. The second one that you saw was the larger waterfall that we saw. And uh, it was a very neat spot just to see the, uh, uh, the natural environment for Vancouver. Our next destination was Lighthouse Park, which is, uh, as you can tell, had a lighthouse in it. And all the parks in Vancouver and throughout uh, the entire area were just wonderful parks. Boy, are they lucky to have so many fantastic parks. Those uh, uh, planning people up there did a great job, even over 100 years ago, in planning for the future. Uh, but this is one of their beautiful parks, and it's located on the shores of West Vancouver. It's not actually in Vancouver, um, but you did have great views of the city of Vancouver and some of the uh, shipping ships and, and other um, uh, vessels in the water there. And there's uh, downtown Vancouver that was the view from the Lighthouse Park. And uh, here's just another view, and this is unfortunately where a phone was dropped, and it did not survive. <laughs> Tim? This is... Uh one of the signature trees up there is the Argutus menziesii. We saw a few of them. We didn't see a lot, but I can't see it in this picture. The bark on these is spectacular. Uh, it's just a cinnamon color. Uh, it stands out. They're evergreen. I don't, um, we, for those of you who did participate in the pre-order plant sale, there was a relative of this, Argutus unido, which is European, but um, this, is, this is much prettier than Argutus unido, but we can't grow this one, unfortunately. Beautiful evergreen, though, broadleaf evergreen, and I think you're going to have to okay. click me. And this is one we may be growing, you may grow in the garden here. You know, this is Mahonia aquifolium. There's two species that we actually saw while we were there. This is the more common of them for us here, but um, I didn't see, I only saw it once when we were there, and it was actually here at the lighthouse. Um, you also saw Mahonia pina, uh, pinata. Okay. And then this is one of the orchids. Uh, I just happened to come across this. There was a, a child who had thrown a frisbee or something into this thicket, and I actually helped them get the, the, the parents would not venture into this thicket. And so I j uh, jumped in, and in the process, I managed to find this nice collection of uh, Gudurea of Longifolia, which I was very happy to do that, because if I had not helped them out, uh, I wouldn't have found it. It was growing on a rock, actually. Uh, we have our own species here as well, but it looks a little bit different. Okay. Uh, that was the end of uh, our first day, which was quite an exhausting day. We were up at 3 a.m. over there, and boy, we were out past dinner time over there yeah. in uh, uh, Vancouver and West Vancouver, weren't we? So, again, here we are on September 19th, right? Uh, <laughs> August 19th, sorry about that. Uh, first, uh, first visit on uh, the second day was the uh, University of British Columbia Botanical Garden and Center for Plant Research. And boy, what a place. 
But we got there and we were greeted by a wonderful bald eagle that flew right over our heads as we uh, 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 were waiting for uh, our tour guide. And here's our tour guide right here, and this is Douglas Justice, who is a uh, multifaceted individual, a lot of titles. He's their associate director, curator of collections, and their research scientist. And boy, did he give us a tour. We had a two and a half hour tour with Doug, or Douglas, and he just took us throughout the entire garden. It was fantastic. Uh, and I'm going to show you a couple of the gardens that I found kind of interesting. This is their food garden. And the food garden is a living demonstration of varieties and techniques for growing different uh, vegetables and fruits. And they have uh, over a hundred different kinds of fruit trees that run the perimeter of the overall garden. And the fruits and vegetables are uh, harvested by the friends of the garden and are donated to local charities. So a great project over there. And uh, this was, oh boy, this is something else. This is the E.H. Uh, Logan Brunner Alpine Garden. I've never seen an Alpine garden that I can remember at least, and it was an awesome example of it. They had representations from every single continent other than Antarctica. I, I right. think it's the largest in North America. It's, uh, what I wrote down over here says one of the largest alpine gardens. It was quite large and very impressive. And lots of rocks which came from the property during a construction project in the early days of the gardens. And Tim? Okay, and we're going to talk some of the plants, which we'll see a few of the plants from the rock garden a little bit later. But this was one, just as we came into the garden itself in the woods, that it just took me. I love the, the Roscoe uh, auriculati here. This is one of the uh, hardy gingers. Uh, we'd love to try some of the Roscoeas here. Some of them, I have one little one in the bathhouse, but not this one. Uh, this, the flowers on this are about two or three inches um, long, I guess you'd say, or tall. Um, so it's really spectacular. Okay. And uh, Karinga Shoma, Paul not, no, Paul Nada. Karinga Shoma, we can grow it here, but it might get 18 inches tall. <laughs> this was five or six feet tall. And this is an enormous clump, just spectacular on how things grow out there. It's so different from here. We can grow some things much better than them, but they can grow a lot of things that we can't grow. Or uh, So that was just one that grew like a weed for them. In Paris, this is uh, Paris polyphyla, variety polyphyla. This was one I didn't even notice it until I saw Mark standing next to it. And it was waist high, or higher, actually. It was like three and a half feet tall. I don't know if you're familiar with Paris, but they're next akin to the Trillium, and uh, this is spectacular. Tony even has a few down at Plant the Lights, but nothing like this. That was a, uh, like I said, three and a half feet tall and probably a good four foot uh, wide clump of it. Um, and those individual fl uh, flowers are probably five or six inches wide um, that you look at, they, you know, like right there. It was just spectacular. Okay, Chris. And I love begonias, running begonias. And this is one, I'd love to get this one, this begonia taliensis. Um, I've seen other forms, but they weren't this patterned form, which was just spectacular. Those leaves, that was probably about six inches across. And that was growing in very dense shade underneath a, a very large uh, Aegis nobilis, if I remember right. Uh, okay? And then this is one of, if Mark had been here, he, he loves this plant. We, actually managed to get one of these. So, uh, and we have another one, but uh, uh, but we got this specific cultivar. But this is Carpinus vangiana, uh, Wharton's Choice, and it's known for these really long involucres, uh, chains of involucres on those. Those can get up to like eight to 10 inches long, uh, very different from our own uh, Carpinus, which maybe get three or four inches long, than most others. I think its common name is like monkey's tail or something like that. You know? um, but it's not readily available in the country. It's hard to find different uh, different ones, but we've managed to procure two different clones. So we're hoping to get some get them planted in the garden and get some uh, seeds off them, ultimately. Okay. Now we're going to the rock garden. This, if of all things, is you wouldn't want to touch that. It's rather spiny. This is a. Um, a pea, actually, or, or like a broom. It looks like a hedgehog, yes. Uh, Arine, I smell like a hedgehog. Aracea, I can't spit this out. Arinacea, uh, Anopolis. It's from Africa, if I remember right. There was, we said about the different continents being represented. I could be wrong though on that. But I think this is maybe, the, it's either that or the European section. But um, I just thought that was so cool. I'm guessing it has yellow flowers in the spring, but late winter, spring. I'd love to see this that whole rock garden there at different times. In the spring would be the time to see it, but there was stuff flowering now as well. Uh, Chris, you want to go on? 
This is one of the southwestern plants. This is uh, one of the perennial zinnias, zinnia grandiflora, uh, which forms little tufts. I saw this in um, Denver as well. It's very hardy, but I don't know if it would take the moisture in our climate. Yeah, that would be the um, thing that would kill it here. But just they cover themselves with uh, flowers, and they last for a really long time, almost like an everlasting. The, the petals um, stay. They don't, don't quite dry, but it uh, forms a little bush. Okay. And Arctostaphylos, I didn't see what called, or the species this was. There's so many Arctostaphylos. These are in the Western uh, North America. They're next akin to the Arbutus, actually. And I remember seeing some of these in um, both in Colorado as well as in uh, Oregon when I was out there a few years ago. But uh, just seeing full-size specimens, uh, really cool. Uh, you probably don't notice it, but there's buds all over this thing. It would flower in late uh, winter, early spring much like Arbutus does. Um, so. Okay, Chris. I didn't mention earlier, but if anyone on the trip has a story to say as we're going along, go ahead and just bother right in. Please do. Uh, we were off to Stanley Park next, and our first destination in this park after we had lunch at their famous fish house was the uh, Air Force Garden Remembrance. And this was just a, a very lovely wooden, woodland garden. And we can see Marty Howard over here, and she's underneath a weeping sequoia dendron. Oh boy, was it awesome. awesome. And um, uh, Stanley Park is just something else. That was just an amazing park, and it is huge. And a lot of different things to offer. One of the uh, gardens they had over there was the Rose Garden which kind of oozes across the street into a large floral display. And they had quite a few uh, roses. They claim that they have 3,500 rose bushes. That's a whole lot. And the rose garden was started in the 1920s by the uh, local Kiwani Club. And here's some of their floral display gardens, which were located across the street. And uh, they're just loaded with tender perennials and um, uh, 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 a lot of uh, herbaceous annuals. And, and just beautiful specimens. heavily planted. Look at those great uh, specimen trees. The uh, Xanthocypris nucicatensis. This is a ginkgo. Who knows what kind of spruce or, uh, or aves that is, or that is fir. You know, just countless. Conifers, are, there are king of conifers out there. The whole park was not intensely planted like this, but where it was intensely planted, it was something else. And I uh, had to include this photograph of Jackie, who found one of the alien uh, seed heads to be quite amazing. Liked it so much that up on top of the head it went and turned into a lovely crown. I thought that was just adorable. Had a good time, as you can tell. Uh, one of the ways to enjoy Stanley Park is to go on their uh, horse store and carriages, but they do offer a variety of different services uh, uh, to getting around to the park. We, uh, we drove around in three uh, minivans we rented, and we had uh, uh, great success, success use, with using them other than Tim, whose GPS did not cooperate. <laughs> Figured it out. Most of us blame it on Tim. Um, uh, Stanley Park, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, uh, founded by the city, and uh, they did uh, found this park 125 years ago, which is extremely impressive, because Vancouver itself is a whopping 127 years old this year. Uh, so we had uh, some city planners back there 125 years ago that were smart enough to set, set aside a huge chunk of land wow. near the core of Vancouver for the enjoyment of all the citizens. And it's not a small park. It's not like J.C. Park and Wade Avenue or even Horseshoe Park that they're doing up on uh, Lewisburg. This is huge. I forget how many acres it was, but well <laughs> over a thousand, wouldn't you say, Tim? Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah. And, and we didn't go to any of the natural <laughs> areas, but it was full yes. of natural areas with old growth. Um, uh, 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 that is Douglas fir uh, in there and various other conifers. Um, uh, found a photo. I mean, forget. Uh, I forgot about taking it up, uh, taking this photograph. But we have Meredith and Anna, or uh, um, uh, yes. uh, yeah, Anna, excuse me, uh, just enjoying a nice or relaxing break from all of our walking, which is good. We had a lot of walking to do, didn't we? And uh, uh, one of our destinations was, of course, the totem pole collection they have over there at the park which according to their website, this is the single largest or, or most attended tourist attractions in all of Vancouver is the to uh, totem pole collection. By the crowd, it was very obvious, it's very popular. But the totem poles were added to the park in the 1920s. They were moved to their current location in the 50s and the 80s. They uh, moved all the totem poles and uh, donated them to uh, local museums for preservation. And what we saw were replicas that were made in, uh, made it, excuse me, but they don't do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> replicas were made in the 80s <laughs> and uh, put out there for everyone to enjoy. Boy, they do a good job. 
Uh, across the street from the totem poles, we got a great view of downtown Vancouver, and look at that convention center. I've never seen a green, a green roof that large, and what a great view of it. Uh, very visible from uh, ground level, and, and just an awesome job. But that is their convention center. And across the street is, uh, I guess that's the other side of the That's the other side of the island. island. My group who took their time and we stopped and we caught out and we took <laughs> pictures of a few places, including the, the Lionsgate Bridge, which we crossed this a couple times in the first few days. Um, but this is, comes out the, let's see, the northwest end of the, uh, the park and goes over to the west. Um, so it pays to get lost then, Tim? Pardon? I said it pays to get lost once We didn't get lost this time. The others will tell you that. Yeah, I don't believe that. We got to see, you said Horseshoe. We saw all kinds. We had Horseshoe Bay and Marine Drive that you guys didn't see. Tim? Let's see. Yeah, we're here at the Air Force, yeah, the Air Force Garden of Remembrance again. And this was just one of the nice plantings on the there. And this, we can grow this here. This is Rubinia pseudoacacia frise. Uh, it turns green in about a week for us. You know, it, for you know, a week in April it looks like this. But this was in the middle of August. And it's still this bright glowing yellow. And of course they have some Japanese, no wait, no, that's a corn for there. There was a second I was going to say Japanese maple. But there was all kinds of little stuff growing in this little rock garden here. Euphorbia, there were uh, brassicaceae, that is uh, some crest and stuff growing down in here. Just all kinds of cool things. Okay. And then this was just across, like Chris said, in the display beds. Just thought that was spectacular, the color. Of it. And of course, they're growing our sweet potatoes, which that's probably one of the Sweet Caroline series, which are probably developed right back here at the, um, uh, the Hort Field Lab. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's Beringium here, which are uh, sea hollies, and um, Persicaria, which we're familiar with here. We grow that, and of course, Black Eyed Susan's. But it's just a beautiful display. And I love fuchsias. But unfortunately, fuchsias don't love North or the hot conditions we have in this part of North Carolina. So I was just in heaven seeing these. Um, this is fuchsia magellanica aria. As you can see, it's it's yellow. Um, love that one. Okay, Chris. This one I used to grow. This one back home in Pennsylvania in a pot. Though I did the straight species I could grow uh, in the ground there, but I still have one. But fuchsia magellanica variety gracilis tricolor. Just beautiful variegated foliage on this. You don't even need to have the flowers, but then they're bonus. And that's probably about three or four feet tall. And then this was just this Magellanica species, and that's about eight feet tall. So, you know, hummingbirds just adore these things. We saw some other um, hybrid fuchsias as well as there was another tiny flowered one. It might have been microphylla that we saw uh, in Stanley Park as well, but I wish we could grow them down here. There's only a handful that'll like it here. Uh, they don't do this, do this here. Uh, so that was that was one of my my favorite things from Stanley Park. I have to say, okay, from all the gardens, right? <laughs> yeah, I like pictures. I have a picture from other places. Stanley Park was our last uh, official visit of the day, so we headed back to the hotel. Down. And uh, after the hotel, a group of us went out for dinner that night and chose to drive along the coast and look for a great restaurant. We had one in mind, but I think they had. 45 minute wait, an hour wait, something like that, and it was great there actually. And uh, so we just uh, stopped off at the restaurant and enjoyed the scenes <coughs> of the uh, local Sunset Beach. And one thing I thought was awfully neat was the tree on the tippy top of that one uh, large building over there. That was something else. Uh, wow. But we did enjoy a, a great evening dinner over there, and uh, we watched sunsets uh, from our table, which was just fantastic right there. Uh, day three, again, September, uh, August 20th, 20th. <laughs> and uh, this was our Van Dusen day, and we started the day off in Van Dusen, and uh, we had a bunch of wonderful guides. I was only told we had Beryl to uh, be our speaker, but Beryl was their uh, acting curator of collections. Beryl is the third one from the left. Tim? This one? No. Nope. Oh, Beryl. That's Beryl, right. there you go. Yes, I forgot. It's Just like Beryl that Road that we're on, but uh, that's Beryl. She's the acting curator of collections. Our other tour guide was uh, Samantha, who is the plant documentation specialist. She has the awesome shirt that says, I'll get it, uh, I'll get the toolbox or toolkit. And it's a picture of duct tape, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> we had a third guide who was a surprise to us, and I hate to say, didn't wear his name tag, and I don't think any of us remember his name. So it's very unfortunate, he did a great job. But we were greeted by their interim director, and that's Howard Norman right there in the center, wearing the blue shirt. It's very nice to uh, be greeted by him. 
and they tell us a little bit about the gardens and about the building. Their building is uh, brand new and uh, cost them $22 million and is a LEED certified visitor center and it was quite impressive. And behind them you can see one of the uh, our artwork that they have. They had a wonderful sculpture exhibit made out of wood and it was throughout the entire garden. You greeted, you're greeted with it right there inside their visitor center. And uh, boy, did they have views at Van Dusen. They were quite awesome. I don't know about you, but I love water gardens. Uh, almost anywhere we visit, I kept on telling Mark, we need one of those. Yeah. Uh, he, he won't do it for me, unfortunately. But wow, look at that great view. Wonder, wonderful water garden pond. And um, uh, an interesting thing to note about Van Dusen is that in a former life, this property was a golf course. And that property was rented from the railroad company. And when the uh, golf course could no longer use the land, it uh, was open. And they had to decide what to uh, use it for. And a lot of great ideas, of course. And one of the ideas was a public garden. And look what they got out of it. They got a fantastic botanic garden full of fantastic collections. Uh, this is their touch wood sculpture exhibit. This is just the one that I think all of us really liked, is the, I guess, squid. Um, going through the grass. Going through the grass. It's <laughs> <was> fantastic. <laughs> But they had the sculptures throughout the garden. They were actually the uh, site of an international um, a sculpture exhibit uh, in 1970, I think 75, and a lot of that artwork still remains. Um, but we weren't there to see the plants, although we did see a lot of wildlife, and here we saw a barred owl. There, there were two of them up in the trees, but this is a good close-up of one of the barred owls. And um, here's Jackie again with her husband, Art, and uh, this was just a, a beautiful photograph. I didn't quite remember it right, but they did comment uh, what a nice spot that'd be for a wedding, so we kind of held a little impromptu uh, uh, renewing of their vows, vows. Not that Enix were very good at doing that, but wow, what a great scene. This is just a bed of all seedling plants, or plants that had grown from seed, cosmos and uh, sunflowers and the like, and uh, very outstanding. Uh, we lost Tim in a maze uh, for a long time. 45 seconds. Uh, no, like 45 minutes, I think. Uh, luckily, he didn't have his GPS, which he couldn't uh, handle very well. But uh, we did lose him in there for a very long time. Uh, actually, Lesson. there was a family in there lost, and Tim did help him get out. I did make fun of, of Tim quite a bit. I was through it very quickly. Uh, here's just another water garden scene. I happen to love him quite a bit. Uh, and a garden that I uh, thought was quite amazing. Um, I couldn't find the official name of it, so we'll just call it their color border. Uh, this bed was full of all kinds of uh, uh, perennials and tender and or tender perennials uh, that featured color. Whether well, it was in some cases a few flowers, but colorful foliage of the plants, uh, some uh, uh, greens and a lot of burgundies. Uh, very hard spot to take photographs because there was a lot of bright spots, a lot of shaded spots, and through all of our photographs, this was as good as I could find. It was absolutely stunning. And Tim. Okay, I thought this one was very appropriate, and it's about oh, 27 years ago that this one was named. This is Pelargonium Vancouver Centennial. This is one also used to grow, so I just thought that was very appropriate seeing that in Vancouver. So, okay. And uh, Dixonia Antarctica, they had several of these. Um, this is the Tasmanian tree fern, and um, I think they said that they got them, they were confiscated because they were smuggled into the country. Uh, and they were good sized ones, so they had had them several years. But seeing tree ferns that are hardy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, CJ, CJ, do you still have one? Yep. But it's tiny, right? Yeah. yeah. Slow. Yes, yeah, very, very slow. Very slow. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> in a very protected spot. for about five years. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, okay, Chris. But their fernery was spectacular. <laughs> um, and then, of course, Arcaria arcana. I just love that tree. It's does not like our climate. You occasionally see them here, and they'll survive for a little while it's to do it. Well. Um, but very nasty monkey puzzle tree from uh, uh, from Argentina and I think probably Bolivia. They were everywhere. Uh, but they'll, uh, they actually like it cooler than what we have here in the summer, so that's what's our problem. But we have some, we're working with some other species, but they're not as cool as that. Uh, but yeah, we saw, those were some of the nicest ones we saw. Okay. And of course, Chris, this is actually a continuation of Chris's picture, almost, St. Um, Gunnera, which just the Gunnera, you saw it in several places, the, I don't, enormous, giant rhubarb is one of the common names for it, uh, but so cool, uh, and we can't grow that one either because of our heat. In, in case you're missing the scale, that leaf could be behind me and over my head and down on the ground and laying on the ground. They are huge. It might be eight feet, six, eight feet across. 
Uh, uh, I mentioned several times already how blessed they are with a lot of great parks. They're also blessed with a lot of great gardens. We just visited Van Dusen, and here we are over at the uh, Queen Elizabeth Park. You would think, based upon normal cities, it'd be really far away. This is a half mile from the other garden. It is that close. We could have walked over to it. Boy, would it. Just a wonderful park. But we were there to see the Bloedel Conservatory, which you can see in the background over there. Just a, a great geodesic dome. And um, we had a, a very interesting tour guide. Uh, this was not who we were supposed to have, uh, but we were very lucky and, and wound up with him. Dan was, uh, or is, uh, one of the interns with the uh, Vancouver Park System. So we got to learn about what being an intern with the park system is like. Uh, they rotate in every single park in the entire park system, and it takes them four years to go through that entire uh, internship. Our interns last two and a half months, maybe. <laughs> Theirs are a four-year program, and they are so highly coveted of a, uh, a position that there are more applicants every single year than they can handle. And I think I remember Dan saying this was the first year they actually opened up the applicants to people outside of city employees of Vancouver. That and that's where the employees. Yeah, I was going to say it's had been mostly from within the city employees that they were I think, selecting. I think solely. Is it what wasn't Dan said. students per se. Yeah. Um, but Dan had actually applied for it in the past. Um, but again, it's a very highly coveted position. Um, so just just an amazing uh, a tour. Just got to learn about all that. Uh, and uh, the greenhouse itself, or the conservatory, is full of tropical plants, which of course we all love. But it had a lot of very pampered parrots and uh, some other um, uh, uh, birds inside there. This got a donation of over, I think, over 100 different birds when yeah, like they that. were all inside there. But uh, uh, Dan had already learned all of the uh, parrots and uh, uh, told us about every single one of them. Uh, the conservatory is not the only thing at that park. It is full of other um, uh, uh, gardens to see. And uh, according to Mark, there is a very extensive arboretum at the uh, Beacon, or Beacon Hill, that Ellen, was, uh, Queen, Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth, thank you. Uh, <laughs> so many great gardens. Uh, but they had featured a very nice arboretum. But instead of the arboretum, we went to the quarry garden, which was right next to uh, the conservatory. Just kind of walk a little bit, and you are greeted with that. You're just up on top of it and look down on that. And what an impressive view. It won't fit in the single photograph, so we made a panorama for you all to enjoy. And, just imagine seeing that in real life. And what a great view of looking at the garbs from high up above. That's just a view you don't get to see in a lot of spots. And we are very lucky to see that. It's like a miniature uh, Bouchard garden, which we played. Yes. Uh, and here's a view from inside that actual garden itself. And you can see the conservatory up on top of the hill. Uh, I guess not really a hill, is it? Although it was on, uh, the whole garden was on top of a hill. So it had great views. And uh, here's a view of their little quarry garden, which was on the other side, and it's had a great view of uh, downtown Vancouver from it. So just fantastic views. Tim? We didn't have totally, or we didn't feel totally out of place here, especially, because this would be a taxodium disticum here. Uh, you didn't see too many bald cypress growing out there. And this was actually one of the largest ones I saw. But you see them relatively commonly used here. So I just thought that was kind of interesting here. And then you can see the gun right here again. <laughs> so, but, uh, OK. Uh, Mechanopsis. We didn't get to see the Mechanopsis, but, uh, the blue flowered Mechanopsis or blue um, um, Himalayan blue poppies, but we did get to see one of their some of their European cousins, the uh, Mechanopsis cambrica. Saw in a few spots, including this one here at uh, um, uh, the Bloedel Reserve, um, or not Bloedel Reserve, the yeah, Queen Elizabeth Park. Um, but anyways, this was a, an orangey one instead of the blues. They were all done when we were um, out there, so. Okay. We should have photoshopped it. <laughs> <laughs> and this is my panoramic of looking at Vancouver way out here in the distance, uh, from right across from the conservatory. And down in the, um, and there, there were some, there was this view. I thought this was a really nice view. We, no, you don't see too many taxes down here, but uh, where I'm from, we can grow taxes, but the deer love them too. But this was a nice variegated one. I don't know what cultivar it was. But the, the next slide, I think, shows it in a little bit different proportions. It's, this is the, the U here. It was probably 15 and 20 feet tall. And then against that variegated foliage, against like the blue spruce, and there were so many other um, colors of foliage around it and textures. It was just really spectacular. Because of the uh, temperatures at night over there in the summertime, the plants just don't yeah. lose their colors like they, they do. They don't bleach. Tim mentioned the, uh, 
the yellow plant earlier over at the uh, uh, Stanley Park, but even the burgundies all remain in the plant. It's quite outstanding. Uh, our next visit in that day was the uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen Classical Chinese Garden. What a visit that was. Uh, this was a, a very interesting tour guide. Uh, her name was uh, Susan Ma. She was our only non-horticultural tour guide of our entire visit. I believe she um, studied Chinese studies. Yeah, Is that correct? Yeah, she was uh, Chinese, or Asian studies. Asian studies. What a perfect spot for her and what a great guide that we had. Um, but uh, the, uh, chi the classic Chinese garden is uh, located in Chinatown and it is surrounded by buildings and you would never imagine that while you're actually inside of the gardens. Um, but the uh, gardens and buildings were modeled after a scholar's household from the Ming Dynasty, which is uh, uh, 1350 to 1750. And uh, here we go, here's some of the buildings right there. And a um, uh, very interesting thing to note is that the gardens were made by Chinese artisans and craftsmen using ancient techniques. And uh, all the materials were actually imported from China. Not only the people were imported, but all of the materials were imported from China also. Even the pebbles that you see here in, in this uh, uh, great uh, flooring were imported from China. The whole entire garden was China. And it really showed. And um, I guess about a year in Vancouver, when we were looking to make this, they went over to China and asked them if they would help them do it. And they did. And this is the first Chinese garden made in North America by Chinese. And uh, I think they said something like, uh, how come you've never done it before? And they said, no one's ever asked. Mm -hmm. And here we go, we got a great garden. Isn't that wonderful? And um, uh, the, the stone, plants, water, and made-made structures are the four elements of a classic Ming Dynasty garden. And you can see some of those elements right here in this photograph, just not the, uh, the water scene. But here's some water right here. The fossil limestone uh, rocks that you can see along the edges were also imported from China. Again, everything was. Uh, but they came from Lake Tai. And if I remember the stories correctly, they are no longer available because they are all gone. There's none left. Uh, but Sue, during our travels, told us, told us a wonderful old Chinese proverb I want to share it with everyone. If you want to be happy for one hour, get drunk. If you want to be happy for one year, get married. And if you want to be happy for a lifetime, get a garden. Very appropriate for our group. Here. Uh, and uh, uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, the tour that we had, they had a, a wonderful educational exhibit inside the building off to the side. And they had a calligraphy calligraphy station and Anna tried her hand at it and I think Nancy did too and maybe someone else in our group uh, but just a lot of fun over there. I didn't do uh, too much with the plants but uh, this is just one I thought was cute. We stopped in, in this one area, I don't remember which, what the name of the, the uh, part of it was, but it was, uh, was the Mentha uh, Requinii which they had it planted and it was just tiny, it was in between the rocks, they had it all over the place, but you could smell the mint in the air from it. She was asking who, if, who knew what it was and of course I, I guessed on that one. <laughs> but uh, the plant material was a lot of like what we saw here. There was black pines, Japanese maples, um, so I didn't highlight too many plants here. Okay, right next to the classic Chinese garden, was a very similar named park. This was the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Park, which, unlike the other garden, was not made by Chinese artisans. It was not made with Chinese materials. Uh, this was made by local architects, local workers, using modern-day materials uh, from North and South America. So there's a neat contrast to see the two right next to each other. They kind of actually flowed to it. Um, uh, Tim? Uh, there were some cool plants in here. The Viburnum davidii, which we can't grow here, but we're, we did have a uh, a hybrid, which we're gonna, um, that some of the people at our pre-order plant sale got, but um, has this really cool linear um, venation on the leaves, and we also have cinnamomum out here, Viburnum cinnamomum, which looks very similar to this, but gets much bigger. Uh, this uh, real cool plant, about three or four feet tall, evergreen Viburnum there. Okay, and the uh, hydrangea aspera. Um, yeah. We have some in the Laugh House now in the Asian Valley, but they don't look like this. It was just it was spectacular. There's a close up of the, the flower head. It's long gone and flower wise, but it was still just spectacular. The leaves on this. It might be one that was uh, Macrophylla as I mean Hydrangea aspera uh, Macrophylla uh, was a cultivar, and I'm guessing that might have been what's uh, what what it was, but I could be wrong on that. But it was just a spectacular plant. 
we head off through Chinatown for our dinner at Jade Dynasty. And uh, we had wonderful fried, or, uh, flat geckos. I, know, just kidding. I have no idea where Mark saw those, but he did. And Mark said that these were used to make a tea. I hope that was not the they tea. They make that every we the tea. <laughs> but it, that was weird. But here's our dessert. That was with a uh, little mango gelatin fish. Chris actually ate the fish. Yeah, this, this is a fish that I ate. Yeah. See, see, Bobby, I do eat fish. Yeah. What did you eat at the fish house? Or mango gelatin. What did you eat at the fish house, Chris? Uh, a cheeseburger. <laughs> yeah, I ate that with chopsticks. Actually, it was eating Jello with chopsticks. Uh, but after dinner, we went back to our hotel, and on this day, Tim and I went and walked the uh, beach uh, to, to see some sights during sunset. Got a rowing crew right here, uh, Tim. And then this was Mark had told us about this one. This is he said the largest potted plant you're going to see. <laughs> this is a sequoia dendro giganteum, and you can see the pot there. It has to be something rooted into the ground there. I'm sure. I can't believe that thing is just growing in that tiny little pot. But that was between the buildings there. I can't believe it hasn't broken the pot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The trunk's almost as big as the pot. But uh, just like some of the gardens, even the city had art along the beach. And here's just uh, one of the uh, pieces of art along the beach. And just some really nice views there as the setting sun. Well, look how many people are out there on a weekday just enjoying sunset near downtown. That it, was the, Tuesday? The beach was full. Is it Tuesday? Uh, yeah, Tuesday. yeah, I think so. And uh, on our way back, we saw the full moon rise through the uh, uh, downtown cityscape. And we got back to the hotel, we popped up on the roof and uh, enjoyed this scene. This, I think, was Tim's first long uh, uh, multi-second shot. Mm -hmm. Here we are on day four, August uh, 21st. And this was a travel day for us. So we hopped on to the uh, British Columbia ferry system and we went between uh, Tawasson Bay and uh, Swartz Bay, uh, or I'm sorry, Tawasson and the Swartz Bay Ferry. And that's what our ship looked like. We were just in a sister ship. And uh, I think I had some statistics. Yes, we do. Uh, they're about 550 feet long, and they can handle 2,000 people and 400 cars each. So they're quite large. We uh, really hoped that we would see a lot of wildlife on the trip. And the vast majority of them were not very successful. So there's our sea lion that we saw right there. And uh, I thought it was very interesting. Uh, Kate was the um, onboard education person, and she had a uh, 20 minute session or so up on top of the ship that discussed, or where she discussed all the wildlife that you could see along the, uh, uh, the, um, the route that we took. Uh, Tim did see a, a couple of things though, I guess. And here's just one of the scenes that we saw. Um, a lot of scenery, and here's uh, Tim. See, see the seals, harbor seals. They didn't see these, I did. So <laughs> there's at least six in this picture. Okay, Chris, next, bit, next one. And you see, we had to do it the Canadian way. Uh, hard work with it, a big yes. you in there. Um, and see more seals. The sea lions have ears, and seals don't, and the way they move is a little bit different. That's, that's um, when we got to Victoria, that was supposed to be a day on your own, and several people did take us up on that offer. I believe, was it Art? Did you take, uh, or did you go golfing? Yeah. Uh, so we had someone that went golfing. But at least about a third of us uh, took off and went to Goldstream Provincial Park, and we were there to see Niagara Falls. It is not clearly the same thing, but supposedly the height's the same. The volume is a whole lot different, uh, <laughs> significantly different. Um, we were there in uh, uh, British Columbia during their dry season. Uh, the mountains in Washington do block the, uh, I guess, the flow of moisture. And uh, uh, Vancouver had no rain at all during July. And I believe their first rain in August when we, was the day that we got there and missed it ever so lightly. So it was quite dry. So this uh, waterfall was uh, the last little trickle from the summer, and it should pick up after that, because uh, that, that stream is a uh, spawning stream for, um, um, was it chum? Who knows? Or chum, uh, chum, chum salmon, I believe. Uh, when the waterfall fell, it filled a small pool right there. We got there, there were some kids that were just getting out of the water, and they were quite cold. Um, but this waterfall only filled the basin of water. And then in that basin, it didn't flow into a stream. It was just rocks after that, with no water flowing in at all. It just got absorbed in the ground. Uh, we walked ground. down the stream bed. Yep. We did not. Walk and through the, the path. drainage culvert underneath the highway. Yeah. That's how there was no water, water going through. <laughs> uh, and here's where the water eventually flows to. This is near their visitor center, and this is just the open wetlands, and you can see how dry it is uh, over there. 
uh, we went back to the hotel after that and uh, picked up a different group and we went whale watching uh, with Orca, Orca Spirit Adventures and this is our uh, grand boat that we went out on which uh, was just wonderful to do and uh, maybe hard to believe but that little thing in the back had a bathroom should any of us need it. <laughs> uh, no one took them up on that offer unfortunately. And, uh, unfortunately, huh? uh, unfortunately, <laughs> like to appear to report. But the uh, going out was quite uh, scenic. Uh, we saw some really cool, I don't know if they're called houseboats, but they were houses that floated on the water. Uh, some of them, I think, were businesses. And um, uh, that's a boat that uh, looks just like ours with people on it. They were just coming back from whale watching, I suppose. And uh, we were told that the whales would be nice and close, we'd have a good view of them, and we'd get there very quickly, which was completely wrong. It took us forever to get to the whales, about an hour trip to get out there. I believe our guide said it was the longest trip that season. And we went almost all the way out to Smith Island in the state of Washington. We were in Washington water for, I think most of the time we saw the whales, actually. Yeah, I think so. That's probably two or three miles right there. So a good trip. And, uh, but we eventually did see the uh, orca out in the ocean. We saw uh, three of them, I believe. And there's a couple of them right there, and they did eventually come closer to our boat. And I think we all missed it when they actually just popped up right next to our boat, which was a very amazing view. And after watching the whales about an hour, we headed on back. And this is where uh, Barbara was very happy that she wore her insulated outfit. And she gave our guide a very hard time about having to wear that outfit. Was, was it, how fast were we going? Did he say and he said it to 40 miles on the way out. How, but how fast? 40 miles an hour. Yeah, 40 it's miles per hour, hour on top of cold water on a cold day. Yeah, it got yeah, kind of chilly. So yeah, she was it, happy to wear was... that. Uh, but on the way back, Nancy on the left and Gail and also Barb sat in the back of the boat and huddled and, and talked and giggled the entire time, which I thought was kind of fun. I was afraid I was going to lose my glasses, so I had my hood up, but Chris did not. You'll see later. And on, on the way back, I saw some more great uh, sights. This is the Trail Island Lighthouse. And, uh, Tim. Oh, and as we were coming into harbor, our, our skipper told us he knew this dog here. It was Goliath, so I put the boat on. And then Chris had a new hairdo when we got back. And his hair looked like it always does when we left, and then it slipped back. It's a very expensive look. That's a hundred dollar hairdo right there. <laughs> Uh, there we go. And there's the group shot. There's the full outfits right there that we wore. I didn't even zipper mine up. I was too cool for that, right? No, it, it wasn't bad, but it did get kind of chilly there. And uh, this is our favorite restaurant of the uh, entire trip. Uh, a lot of fun things happened on that one, including asking, asking for a gluten-free meal, with, uh, which eventually came out with a tortilla on it. Um, but we had to take this photograph because here's Mary Jo trying to read her menu inside the cave. It was very well lit. Uh, she had to use Tim's cell phone to uh, uh, to read the menu for the light, and it didn't help any that she wore her sunglasses all the time. Sunglasses for that, uh, for that day, unfortunately. So just a whole lot of weird things happen. Uh, day five, August twenty second. Uh, this is our first uh, official visiting day in Victoria. We went to Hatley Castle first thing in the morning. And uh, Hatley Castle is uh, a very awesome building made in 1908 by James uh, Dunsmuir, uh, who owned all the coal mines in uh, Victoria or Vancouver Island, so you know he had a little bit of money. Uh, and in 1940, this was purchased, uh, the whole property was purchased by the domain government for $75,000. Wow. I wish I was around that time with that amount of money. I wouldn't have mind, um, wouldn't mind buying that. But it was uh, purchased for a naval training establishment over there. And uh, just for a sign of the money, it did not cost $75,000 to make. Just the stone wall around this building cost $75,000 to make. And their conservatory cost an equal amount. So after the family passed away, the estate did not get very rich selling the property, unfortunately. <laughs> this wasn't sold at a very good time. Here's a different view of the Hatley Castle. And uh, 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 eventually, in 1995, it was uh, changed over to the Royal Roads uh, University. And that was uh, done by a legislative assembly of the province of British Columbia. Some of you may recognize the building, especially if you watch some of the X-Men movies. This is the uh, movie where they have the school for the gifted, if I'm not mistaken. So you'll see this building used in a lot of uh, films and um, uh, other television shows. But here we have our tour guide for the day. That's Barry Agar in the green. She's the head gardener of uh, 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 the gardens at uh, um, around Hatley Castle. 
she took us on a great tour. In fact, our group enjoyed it so much that we voted to uh, extend our tour, and uh, which kind of ate into our um, a lunchtime. But they had a lot of formal gardens throughout um, or around the uh, castle itself, and some walled gardens that were just quite outstanding. A lot of uh, pruned hedges, but with um, some relatively informal plantings. At least I thought they were informal, very flowy. But look at that great view. And here's our Japanese garden, which is down in over. No, Mark called it Japanese garden. Japanese. Asian garden. Here's That's our Asian garden. A uh, great pool of water. And I thought this was awfully neat. They have so many spawning fish out there that they made a fish ladder to help the uh, fish get up into their Asian garden pond as they spawn. I thought that was very nice. Uh, Tim? Uh, some of the cool plants. This is a South American plant that we can't grow. Eucryphia exendermania. We do have one in the nursery right now, but I don't expect it to make it. But we'll find out. <laughs> Mark got it in England. The, um, just the dahlias in this garden were spectacular. I don't know what cultivar that was, but uh, if, if you were watching my photos earlier, there, I had a bigger picture of these, but dahlias in general, they were just spectacular. You'll see some later on. And then uh, I love Zostronaria, uh, and this is Zostronaria californica. This was a beautiful selection with the silver foliage against that red flower, um, often called uh, California, I mean, or California fuchsia, but it's actually related to fuchsia too. So. Uh, okay. And after the extended stay over at Hadley Castle, we were off to Abkhazi Gardens, which is just a fantastic oasis in a suburban area of uh, Victoria. And uh, the home was built on top of a rock outcliff. If you think you have a rock problem in your yard, these, uh, these folks <laughs> certainly did so in, uh, in their garden. But they used it to their advantage and they did a great job in doing that. Uh, just a spectacular job. Uh, but the gardens were made by Prince and Princess Abkhazi, and they were begun in 1946, which is the year they got married. And in uh, 2000, the Land Conservancy purchased the property, and they've been managing it ever since. And they saved it from becoming a townhome development. Tim? Uh, some of the cool plants there. This was, um, I believe, A.B.'s uh, Pinsapo. And this was just so cool. This doesn't look like much here, but go to the next slide. This is like enormous. It's on a. It's leaning over. It's. It was just so cool walking underneath this thing, uh, and then everything that was growing around it. Just, it, was, it was really cool. Uh, and then this was just a cool vine that they had there, uh, um, Bellardiera, uh, Longiflora. Chris, you said you didn't eat one. Did no, you? I was just joking. You, you were just joking. You. These are edible. I'd love to try this, but I think it needs full summers again. It gets. Uh, it's actually in the Pittosporum family. Um, but it's a vine uh, from I, it's either New Zealand or actually I think this is Australian. This species. And there is no Photoshop in any of these images. These are straight out of reality. Yeah, camera. that purple. It, there's purple, white, and pink berried forms. If but, anything, the camera did not do this yeah. justice. It was out. Yeah, the light was high. And this was just a spectacular Cedros Deodor here. I don't know the cultivar in it, so I just said a prostrate form. But that was a good 10 or 12 feet from there to down here. I'm gonna say it was just going over the rocks. Um, that, that rock outcropping Chris was saying about. And it's a spectacular little garden. And I mean, it was just maybe an acre. I'm not even sure. It's, it's not very large, but very was, densely But planted. I mean, wonderful. If you ever get to um, Victoria, you need to go to the Abkhazi garden. And Mark's been <coughs> there in the spring with the spring bulbs. Yeah. And uh, how the cyclamen were in flower. Time. There were hedges of heather, which you saw on the sidewalk there. But they were, some of them were in flower, dependent on which species they were, uh, but that one wasn't. But just to see that at different times of the year, and this is another cool plant. And we were, I was eating, we were eating candy corn here earlier, um, or I was, anyways. And I just love this plant. It just looks like candy corn. This is this a uh, spontanea spinosa. And again, this is a South American plant that does not like it here. Uh, it looks like a, a holly with a little thin, thinly uh, branched holly with these orange flowers that are about an inch and a half long. Um, and we had a small detour at Abkhazi Gardens. Uh, we talked to the volunteers there who were very helpful. Um, as it turned out, our scheduled tour guide apparently left the institution and uh, was a no-show. So we kind of on our own, but we did have a couple guys to help us out a little bit. And uh, they wanted to know where we're visiting next. And we told them we were going to Beacon Hill Park. And they said, oh no, you need to go to Government House. So we did, we believed them. And it was definitely worth that change, wasn't everybody? Yes. Oh yeah, it was a great spot. Uh, so we were supposed to go to the Beacon Hill Park, but we went over to Government House, and uh, this is the residence, the official residence of the Lieutenant Governor, who was the official representative of England. 
So that's an appointed position from the queen. And the grounds are open to the public and are free of charge. And uh, uh, they were just absolutely stunning. Uh, this was in the back of the uh, uh, building, and the, uh, the government house is on top of a, 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 a hill that overlooks Victoria itself. And the uh, natural environment has these Gary Oaks that you can see here, and I thought they were just adorable. It's Tim says they the, get bigger. Yeah, and further south. But this is the northern uh, range for them. They don't go too much further than uh, a few miles north of uh, Victoria. Um, it's only on Vancouver Island, southern part of Vancouver Island. But, but they had a great landscape architecture. Looks like a garden and small trees like that. A little bit of shade for your plants. Beautiful. <laughs> Uh, here's one of their herb gardens that we saw. Uh, tons of gardens throughout this entire facility. They had a bunch of lush borders. The borders were spectacular. Wow. Maintained by volunteers, by the way. Um, they had uh, other gardens. They had a rose garden. That's not what you see here. Uh, but many other delightful gardens. Um, I thought this one was neat just for the benches. And uh, Mary Jo here found a different bench to sit down and enjoy a nice quiet spot. And uh, Tim? And then Agapanthus. 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 <laughs> I just love the agapanthus, and they, we can get them to flower a little here. They were just, look at that, and the variation in colors, there were dark ones, and, and just, that was, I don't know what kind they were, but just spectacular. The really dark blue ones were yeah. intense. We saw them in other places, but they were the best here, I have to say. Okay. And then there's just a nice view. With Nancy was sitting here, and I, I got that picture of her. But the, if you do, again, if you do get to the Victoria, make sure you go to Government House. Uh, that and um, uh, our Kazi Gardens are spectacular. Yeah. And, you, and it, it's, um, you said about volunteers. Most of the gardens out there can't, uh, don't have volunteers, which is kind of crazy. Uh, the um, gardeners are all union. And oh, wow. so <laughs> I think the, the volunteers here are, uh, they are guided by landscapers, I believe, but they're not actually, um, uh, it's not actually manned by gardeners. So, so volunteers at all the gardens you've seen other than this one are all with events and uh, development and other activities like that, not out there in the gardens at all. Um, I believe it was Anna and uh, Meredith, did you um, talk to the um, chauffeur? Yeah. Was yes. you two that did that? Just had an impromptu visit with the chauffeur for the lieutenant governor and went inside of his garage and got a little tour, I believe. We went around back and, and I noticed an old car and, and uh, I walked up to the garage and this guy was just, uh, he was a character to say the least. We t he took us uh, into his garage and it was about the neatest garage I'd ever seen. Everything was just put in perfect place. He had completely rebuilt the old car and uh, he uh, invited us up to his house up to his apartment uh, to see his apartment, and we just kind of said, "Nah, I don't think we want to do that." But he was just a, he was just a, a character. And I think Dennis and his wife had tea. Yeah, we did. Oh, this was I like this rose. I, I, it doesn't have the flowers; it's just for the thorns. Uh, the rose of Cerisia here, uh, and just the light going through them. I've seen these in. Portland. I've never, I don't know how it'll do out here. It might grow here. It might not. I've got it. Does it do anything? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It doesn't grow super fast. Yeah. It's just those thorns on that. Spectacular. Uh, Azara is not something we can probably grow very well here. It's another southern hemisphere plant from South America. Um, I, I was reading later that they have nice honey scented flowers, but I didn't smell it. It was just the nicest plant I'd seen of it. Uh, we saw it at uh, Hadley Castle as well. but. This was a really nice specimen and had quite a few blossoms on it. It's an evergreen shrub. This one is probably 10 or 12 feet tall. Okay. And again, mm. fuchsia. <laughs> that one was like five or six feet tall. That's the biggest tricolor I've ever seen. So um, it, just the vibrant colors. And then we saw the benches here earlier. And then that was actually honeysuckle, the Linus uh, And my guess is ba uh, Bagason's gold there. Um, and how they did that. I've never seen them get that big in our area. I've seen them like that in England, but um, cool plant. And I like, like I said, I like dahlias. This is a species dahlia. <coughs> and my best guess it was Merechii, which is one I've seen um, a few times, but t smaller flowers and uh, this delicate, delicate how it they hang up over the foliage. Uh, like that. So we uh, visited the government house uh, because uh, we were told to go there. So after that was uh, really going to be our end of the day because we chose to do that instead of the uh, Beacon Hill Park. 
but we actually split up into three different groups. Um, uh, one group, I think, went shopping. Uh, if not mistaken, Gail, you guys went shopping to um, uh, a sewing store, and I think another group went back to the hotel for cocktails. Um, I didn't let my group go whether they wanted to or not. We went out for a visit. We were supposed to go to Stanley Park. I'm sorry, Beacon Hill, Beacon Hill, Beacon Hill Park. But on the way there, I saw a spot that I saw uh, that we saw on our uh, whale watching cruise that Tim said he really wanted to go to. So I told the group, we need to go there and make Tim really jealous. So we did. And uh, we wound up at uh, Clover Point Park, which is this really weird, just little jut out into the water, little blob on the top, just a little circular driveway, just to go out and enjoy the, uh, the scenery and the, and the water. But uh, it's actually owned by the Department of Defense, but it's at uh, least in the city of uh, Victoria as, as a park. And you had great views of the surrounding mountains, the uh, uh, Olympic Mountains and uh, uh, Mount Baker, which is a dormant volcano. And it's a popular site for uh, kite flying, windsurfing, and uh, parasailing. <laughs> but we just went out there and just kind of saw some driftwood and some wildlife. And uh, 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 yeah, this, this, this is an aggregate anemone or a clonal anemone. And it's the most abundant species of sea anemone found on rocky uh, uh, rocky shores on the Pacific in this area. And we did see quite a few of them throughout there. And uh, we did eventually hand o head over to uh, Beacon Hill Park. Very glad that we did. We uh, were just going to drive through, but as we were driving through, we saw something really kind of cool, so we had to find a parking spot. And a lot of us got out of the car and walked. I don't think we all did. Uh, they had a wonderful, really long sidewalk that had raised borders on both sides with uh, uh, tender perennials and some annuals throughout. A very long walkway. And um, we kind of lost our group. I was walking down the walk, and part of the group disappeared. I was on my own. And I turned right, and I saw the sundial garden, again, just full of all kinds of stuff. I was so drawn to the plants, I'm not even too sure I even saw the sundial. Uh, here we are looking over at uh, Rose Lake. You see the top right corner. But look how long that path is. It just kept on going all planted with uh, wonderful plants along that border. Oh, so colorful. Uh, there's actually the uh, Rose Lake right there, and that went over to another lake and just kept on going. Uh, this park and Stanley Park both had putting greens inside there, uh, inside the park to, go, to enjoy a little bit of golf. Did you know that, Art? Oh. And that's what we saw on the way in was the water play sculpture, and this was just a, a, a very fun um, a thing for the kids to play in. It did not always look like that. The water spray changed. And in fact, it squirt out the sides of the spout to get the people that were much further out <laughs> into the group. In case you think you were safe, like that lady with her kid, she probably wasn't safe over there. There was someone in the lawn over here, he wasn't even safe. But it squirted out in a different direction, had mist that went out on the top. It just kept on changing what it did. The whole thing didn't move, it just changed where it was squirting. And that's what drew our attention and what made us get out of the car. Uh, but I eventually did um, let everyone go back to the hotel. And when we got there, uh, three of us, Nancy, myself, and Tim, went out for a walk through the city. And we walked over to Holland Point Park, which is the opposite side of the uh, peninsula, I guess is what you call it. And, uh, and just enjoyed a, a city park out there. And I thought that was just a really attractive view. But that shows you how dry it was over there. Grass out on its own was just brown by the time we were there. And uh, this was the, uh, the shore along the uh, Salish, Salish? Salish? Salish Sea and the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And, uh, and on our walk there, uh, this was outside of a business, there was a bench. And underneath the leg on the bench, which you see right there, there was this, uh, just a cyclamen. How often do you see that in Raleigh? And the cyclamen tuber was probably six or eight inches across. You can see it here. I'm gonna guess it's like that big. I, that was just something that caught my eye. Like, like I said, how often do you see that in Raleigh? How <laughs> do people feet not kill it? Yeah. And then just the gardens along this. This was a private residence. Dartmoor, uh, Budlia uh, did the end Dartmoor here with the branch pinnacles, was just spectacular. Uh, don't see it too often, often enough down here. We don't even have it in the garden right now. Uh, okay. And then the, the, the Lava Terrace, which they probably do so so here. I don't know. I haven't tried them yet. But um, this was one, I believe this is Barnsley, which is one of the more common ones. But this was probably eight feet tall. Um, just spectacular along this picket fence and everything. And you can see the hydrange in the background there, and you know, everything was lush, if it was water. <laughs> so those last three slides were on our way to the park. We just yes. had a properly placed slide, I'm sorry about that. 
we did our presentation separately and merged them together, and that was a merging error. But we're back to the park, and here we are. Uh, driftwood was everywhere, and it was just fun to look at and just see all the different forms, and I thought that one was exceptionally pretty. And uh, for some reason, Nancy chose to pick up the kelp. I'm not too sure why she did that, Stop. but she did. And uh, she decided it was gross. And we got the, uh, the kelp. Uh, the, that was mushy. And uh, Tim? Uh, this is one of the rosin weeds. I don't know which species right offhand, but this was Grindelia. It was growing in the crevices and along with pathways on the hillside. It was really nice. But there was also a lot of uh, Lythrus latifolius, which is uh, uh, ever, um, let's see, the perennial sweet pea, which it's not native, but that was naturalized. Not great seeing that. And then, um, uh, let's see, there was. Uh, some other stuff, but there was this was one of the natives, Lupinus arboreus. Now, I've only ever seen this one other time, and that was going 60 miles an hour down the road on <laughs> the coast of uh, Oregon. But I got to actually see it up close in person here. Uh, these, it's a, a probably, it's a small sub shrub basically, lupin instead of the herbaceous ones that we uh, grow here in the east. But uh, it was pretty cool seeing that. Uh, and then this is one of the native uh, Sephora carpos or uh, wow. coral. Coral berries, we have some outside. And this was covering up the hillside as well, uh, which looked really nice along the pathway. You can see the mountains in the background across the uh, strait into Washington. So we finished the park and we walked back a different route uh, through the city of Vancouver through another part of Victoria. Area. Uh, Vic Victoria, I'm sorry about that. And uh, just some amazing gardens. Even they were just worth visiting. And, this uh, dried up wall was even gorgeous. This was the first one we saw. It just a little tiny narrow crack down inside of it, uh, growing plants. We actually met the gardener there. And that was fun to talk to her. But again, look at the lawn, just parched. And uh, this, this was almost next door to that other house. It had a great garden. And uh, I, I thought the little narrow strip for driving was just uh, extra impressive right there. Look at that intensely garden where you drive. And next door to that one garden was this one. Yeah. That's a really nice floor. And that's a oh, continuation of the same garden. The same garden is down a little. There, there was a whole strip of them, and these are the ones that are just border the, the water. And so they get a lot of wind and stuff, but it's very mild. So they were growing a lot of the formiums, which you didn't see them a lot in other places, but we were seeing them right there. Okay. And then this was down another street. The annual um, lavataras here, and sweet peas, the annual sweet peas. This other house over here, I think Chris has some pictures of with pots and stuff. Um, I don't remember what else in this thing. There was just so much in this. We looked in in, yes. uh, in the pathway, into the, the yard. It was just so, so cute. But then, see, they had priorities. The plants there, and then water is precious. Right. See, it's dead here, dead here. <laughs> but then there's the gorgeous plants that they uh, take care of. You can tell they water, can't you? And that's, 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 that's the house. Door. <clears throat> Not big gardeners out in the yard, but their entire front st uh, steps was just covered in pots. Just enough room to walk upstairs. Look at that. Awesome. And then this was, this was in front of a business, which I thought was cute. They did have a little bit of a garden down here, but the, to continue it, they had their, uh, on the telephone pole, they had this painted so it matched that. And then they had the brick, and then they had their hanging basket. <laughs> Was that, I thought it was a bar, wasn't it, or something? I there? think it was a bar, maybe not a bar, but a pub of some sort. It was more restful. But that building was on the corner, and the entire building had hanging baskets. Yeah. They love hanging baskets. There are there hanging was baskets one of these around the everywhere. And the city of Victoria has hanging baskets throughout the city, yeah. and we learned from someone that someone comes out on a water truck at night, truck every night and waters them all when the, uh, the traffic is uh, a like lot better. Between like 10 and two or something. This is on the walk back closer to our hotel, Tim. Yeah, this is uh, the Sequoia Dendron Gigantium Pendulum, which we saw one earlier uh, with uh, Marty, and I, I think underneath it, but in uh, Stanley Park. But this one was really spectacular. Uh, this was, you know, this was just down the block. And right next to that was the uh, uh, British Columbia Legislative Building, a very impressive, uh, impressive government building. See, there's, there's a hanging basket. See them right there? Yeah, right there. Throughout the entire city. Yeah. Amazing. And unfortunately, neither Chris or I got a picture of it, but there was a Sequoia Dendron Gigantium in front of it, which is the, the, the provincial the Christmas tree, and they had it labeled as Sequoia Semper Verde. So we thought that was funny. They had it mislabeled. Uh, that's the coast redwood, not the Sierra redwood. No, it was the Sierra redwood, but they had yeah, it labeled. The they had labeled as the coast redwood, <laughs> is what I was trying to say. So that was kind of fun seeing that. And uh, there's the building that's part of the photograph. That's the, the building all lights lights up like you're down at Disney World at night. 
uh, impressive show. And here's another oh. photograph that Barbara shared with me. And, yeah, that's in uh, front of the princess. Apparently we didn't have to go whale washing. We could have looked at a whale topiary. <laughs> and it wasn't clear. Was this the one that was on top of a stump? That was the other garden, wasn't it? No, they, they, they were both on top of stumps? a stump. That's how they disguised the stump. There you go. So that green part's a stump that they didn't feel like getting rid of, but just city plantings. Look at that. Awesome. And uh, that's the uh, Fairmont Empress, the uh, hotel around the corner. Oh, just look at all the look at all of the light posts that they have. Look at the every single one of them is two. That's how many towns through the city. And uh, you don't see it in this photograph, but along that shore yeah, where here. these people are planting is a floral topiary. It says Victoria. And begonias. begonias. So as you enter the harbor, like on a cruise, you can see and that. There's that little um, airport there too. It's uh, kind of, you're flying in, in, in and out on a pontoon plane. Uh, so day six, August 23rd, was our unfortunate last day of visits. And uh, we visited the gardens at the Horticultural Center of the Pacific. And uh, this is a very interesting institution. Um, they are an educational, um, uh, well, ed educational institution. They teach students horticulture for 10 months. And that's the entire length of their program. So they start there and they're done in 10 months and they work their guard, the gardens the entire time and they're all assigned a different project that they can do in the gardens. Again, they want, but it's a different project. And our tour guide took us through um, uh, the entire site and here's the uh, Takata Japanese Gardens. And uh, there's our tour guide right there. This was Brian McCuffian and uh, he was a, a volunteer with the uh, gardens, not one of the uh, student staff, but they were the They were the... Uh, 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 Union probably so if they were fine. Yeah, that yeah, must have been. But there's a volunteer leading the tour, and uh, wow, these are all Heather's. I like Heather's, Peace but I didn't Heather's. want to like them that much until I saw that collection right there. Just a beautiful oh, collection. Nice. And one of the student projects, if I remember correctly, was uh, revamping the Heather collection, and he had added a whole entire new section uh, there. Look at the great views. And what you don't see is a large pond over here. Well, I reminded Mark that I wanted a pond here. And it was area. formed. It was actually relatively recent. It was formed by Cos Beavers and dammed up a stream. Oh, I missed that part. Yeah, he said that. And, it was not that old, but what a great view of it at the gardens, just uh, down the hill and seeing that. Uh, the gardens were full of artwork also. Yeah. Um, there was a new garden. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Tim? And then I thought this was appropriate. Right at their entrance they had uh, uh, hydrangea arborescence, uh, the OK NCHA uh, mm -hmm. one, Invincible Spirit, which was one that it's from NC State. That's uh, Tom, Dr. Tom Randy's introduction right there. So uh, I just thought that was interesting that it was right there. One. And then this was just kind of a cool plant. I like this plant. I don't know which species of, of blue plurium this was, but this was covered in how uh, bees and wasps and hornets. Uh, <laughs> uh, we saw lots of hornets there. Uh, there's just some full fl uh, flower. The Cryptomeria japonica septkin. We have like three of these in the garden, and they're about uh, they're about th this color. <laughs> they don't. Uh, every we see these septkins in all the gardens we were at, and they were just. You know, this creamy white, here they're green. We get a little bit of white in the spring, and then it turns green. So, um, the difference in temperature. <laughs> okay. And then the heathers. This is uh, just a couple of them here. Uh, this is uh, Arena here, the uh, Colina vulgaris Arena. And then I think I have another one. This is one of the Ericas. But they had countless ones, uh, species. And at the um, government house, there was a whole heather collection. And they had some of the South African ones, which were pretty cool. I didn't know any of the names on those. So. And I like wildlife, so I was trying to get hummingbirds the whole time I was there. There was a male trying to court this female, but he never stood still long enough for me to get a picture of him. <laughs> this was up in a uh, the dead snag and a eucalyptus they had in their, their thing, and that was like 20, 30 feet away from me. Um, I was frantically trying to get my lenses changed on my camera so I could take up close-up pictures, and then all of a sudden, no, I need to take a picture way over there, and this the stupid thing would just fly away. <laughs> About the time I click the lens and snap, he's fly away. So, anyways, uh, this is restios, which are uh, some plants from the southern hemisphere, mostly South Africa and Australia. I think there's a couple from uh, South America, but this is one I had wasn't familiar with. This Colopsis uh, paniculata here, which I love the textures on them. They're kind of like an intermediate between a, a rush and a grass. But they look kind of like an equisetum or a horsetail, but they're not. Um, I have a few in the garden here, but that was just a cool one. Uh, is that, that was an Empress Wu Hosta? I don't know. I don't know what that one was. 
They're hostage to dirty Well, I have that in the garden, but they're just babies, so. I, <laughs> well, hopefully in a few years we'll know. And then uh, Melianthus major, which we saw these in several places. I wish, but the, I think they'll grow here, but they won't do that here. Um, they, again, like a, a little bit more mild temperatures. Cool, uh, warmer winters, cooler summers. Um, that's, a, again, a South Afri or, yeah, Southern African um, plant. They call them peanut butter plants sometimes out there. Um, because of, again, like clarodendron that smells like peanut butter if you crush it. Okay, and then the little Lobelia tupa. This is one I, I, I'd love to try this one. This is a South American Lobelia. Uh, it's actually a xeric growing one, so it's a little bit drier. So I don't know that it'll, um, would take it here in our summers. Uh, but spectacular, and we saw the numerous gardens um, and just drooled over those, and the hummingbirds love those too, of course. So. Okay? And then we were off to the garden, we probably all heard of Bouchard Gardens, and uh, what a spot. Even their uh, sign has a hanging basket hanging inside of it. I don't know how it gets sun, but uh, probably they just it out every week, Chris. Yeah, probably do. But look at that, just awesome. And uh, we had a wonderful tour guide. This is Rick Gordon, Rick Gordon, who was a sunken garden supervisor. Uh, we had a small change in our uh, 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 itinerary for our tour guides. The other one wound up taking vacation for personal leave. And uh, he asked Rick to give the uh, tour guide. Uh, Rick has worked there for 30 years. And his father before him also worked at the garden. So between the two of them, they had over 50 years working in the garden. And this was Rick's first tour. <laughs> they don't do tours. Tours, apparently, as we found out after our tour was done, do not happen at Bouchard Gardens. I still don't know how we got a tour, but we did. We're very lucky that uh, Rick helped us out. But, Normally, uh, it's the uh, publicity that they'll have. Yes, they give about uh, 10 tours a year, and they give them to the media. media is good. And uh, I just asked would they give us a tour, and they said, sure. So we lucked out. So that was very good. So we got Rick there, uh, 10 tours a year, just mentioned. And uh, so this was Rick's first tour. And he spent the whole entire night before studying <laughs> and looking up in yeah, their history sheet. Right there. He had been there 30 years, but wanted to make sure he got it all right. Uh -huh. And what was neat about a lot of these tour guides, and, and I've never even done it myself here at the Arbor Indian Tour, a lot of them studied us. Looked yeah. up on our website. Who were we? What were we interested in? Where did we come from? What kind of plants did we do? So a lot of them did a lot of studying to see what they could do for us. We were really pampered with a lot of great tour guides. And uh, Rick did a great job. That's so this, where he takes care of us. So this is the garden that Rick takes care of. This is the sunken garden over at Bouchard Gardens. You've probably seen this one on postcards and every uh, classic view of the gardens. This is what they're known for right there. Because uh, it's a quarry. Now, this is another quarry. It looks like the one we saw over at, um, uh, if I can run through all of them. Oh, uh, Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth uh, Park. Queen Elizabeth Park. There's but, actually a, a big pond down in here, which is like another 30 feet deeper than... And this was a quarry for, I believe, concrete materials. Yeah. And I believe it was for the uh, for the actual cement, wasn't it? For yeah, the, uh, uh, fast for Portland cement. For Portland cement? Yeah. Uh, so that's what, the, uh, that's what this one exists, or exists here uh, for. But uh, this is just full of annuals, tender perennials, shrubs, and trees. And again, no photoshopping, that's the colors of the gardens. And they're very colorful. Uh, at the end of that was the Ross Fountain, just in a, a natural gorge. And uh, this is just the unsynchronized system. It just continuously moved, and at night it danced to the different colors of the lights inside of it. And it uses a system built decades ago. Uh, put in now, be a whole entire computerized system, but this is just a random show that happens uh, from mechanics. And um, they uh, added a carousel re uh, recently. So a really new introduction. The, um, I believe the current owner, uh, this is still privately owned by the Bouchard family, and it is, was it the granddaughter? I can't like that. The granddaughter owns it, and uh, she wanted a carousel. And when you're the owner, you get yourself a carousel. Uh, while we're talking about uh, the family, uh, some of our group had afternoon tea there. You want to add anything about the afternoon tea? I know you enjoyed it. That was in their old dining room. Okay, nothing, but they had great tea there. Uh, here's our dahlia border. Tim mentioned enjoying the dahlia so much. Some of those dahlias were bigger than your hand if you put your hand up in front of them. There were some that were much bigger. Uh, here's their rose garden, hundreds and hundreds of roses just implanted as uh, shrubbery or over arches. 
uh, down to the Japanese garden, which is a beautiful series of streams and small pools with uh, conifers, ferns, mosses. That doesn't do it justice. No, no it I couldn't find a good photograph of the garden the way I thought it looked like, but uh, amazing garden. Uh, this is their star, star pond, and this held uh, the original owner's ornamental duck collection. <laughs> uh, but now it's an ornamental water garden feature, just beautiful. And uh, up to the Mediterranean Garden, which is another new garden. This is out near their parking lot, and this is for their drought-resistant plants, they said. And uh, we did this garden because it's kind of on the way to their production greenhouses. Rick even took us into their production greenhouses. Mm -hmm. You can see the myosotis, or is that forget-me-not? Yeah, myosotis. Uh, forget-me-not for the winter growth. Yeah. growth. And that's probably all the hanging baskets for their sign, right? Those are the extra ones, yeah, the ones they swap out. Yeah, in, in places like this, you grow extra, so in case someone ruins it, you can put another one out there the next day uh, so people see it. Or How don't many see anything greenhouses was it? It was a whole series of greenhouses. Like we saw one level. Or, yeah. Something like that, or yeah. maybe 40. And they had outside production, too, near their fireworks area. And Tim? And then, yes, I, the, some of you earlier saw these. I just thought these were great. The, the, uh, there's a, I have a whole series of waste receptacles. <laughs> <laughs> they even had green rooms. <laughs> they were all different. And uh, for me, I, um, my background at Penn State was working for a little bit, working for one of um, uh, a geranium breeders. So I know pelargoniums a little bit. And this is just bringing back memories for me. So I'd have a couple pictures of those. But this is mass plantings of Happy Thoughts and um, Wilhelm Lunga. Uh, some of the variegated ones, but they had geraniums throughout their plantings, and Mark would be laughing at me because he just loves uh, mushy plants, as he puts it, the tender stuff. But that's what, it was mass displays of mushy stuff. <laughs> um, all the annuals in here, uh, you know, they swapped it up. Begonias were just spectacular. These are more geraniums here. They were having issues with their geraniums, though, in this area here, but they still looked spectacular. Um, they had a few lantana, but those the tuberous begonias and rigor type begonias, just the colors were wonderful. Uh, see lantana, geraniums, dahlias, begonias, uh, and the ferns that were growing as weeds. The, the uh, a splenium scolopendrium here, which both encrusted and regular leaf forms over here, just all over the rocks. And here, this this I just thought was great. This this little dahlia with the bifold flower, going into the begonia, uh, the single begonias here with the orange and yellow, and then with the coleus and the uh, impatiens back in here. This that continues that same color. And then here's some more pictures of dahlias. And Chris was he didn't say enough. I mean, the dahlias were like some of the biggest ones were like that big, and then small ones might be three or four inches. But then you have them right next to each other. And they know what these are all are, so they keep track of. They dig them every year, mm -hmm. um, and but they had probably had only been flowering for you know a few weeks in relative to the specs that ours were flowering for three months here. So ours look ratty by the end of the season. Well, there's how much staff do they have? I don't know. Um, I don't remember if you said. I don't remember. I don't remember them telling us. But they have you know, a little bit of money. So. <laughs> <laughs> they can. Uh, they said people come there and they don't leave. Um, the Fagus Sylvatica purpurea there, I forget, that one had an age on it. I don't remember how old he said that was. That was one of the original plants I think planted there. It's an enormous beach, uh, purple leaf beach. There was a red, I think a redwood nearby. They, they were right on old. this side here. There were a pair of them right here. I think this might be the edge of them, um, the redwoods. And uh, Cosmos, uh, Ostrosanguinius, the chocolate cosmos, one of the perennial cosmos. Just the whole border of that. And then again, this is the myosotis. These are a little bit bigger. Chris showed pictures of them being grown in pots, but um, these were growing community plants. And they said different gardeners had different preferences. And they would grow them however they wanted them. Uh, if they wanted pots, they got pots. If they wanted them from community flats, they got community flats. If they wanted field grown ones, they got field grown ones. So those uh, wooden flats are made by them. Yes, they still make those. I thought that was pretty neat. Having those back home with his, uh, when I was little, but we don't use, didn't use them anymore. But they're still making them. Like <laughs> and there's the whole group. What a good-looking group. We had a good time. Cool. 
And uh, we went back to the hotel, dropped people off, and uh, I guess, was it just you, Tim? I just went by myself. We, we divided up. Some of them went back, actually, which I think you'll we'll have to get to a little bit. But I, I walked the streets again. And then there was this hedge of this huge shot. I don't know which one this was, but this was a good six or seven feet tall. And they actually sheared it. <laughs> but, <laughs> that huge was a full flower. Uh, this Phygelius erectus. Uh, uh, moon breakers. I've seen little ones that maybe three feet tall, but this was a good six feet tall too. Uh, and then this is a hebe here, and then this thuja. I mean, this was just on a street corner in front of the house. <laughs> uh, and then this was at the out at the coast again, and just this variegated hebe. I just love that. Uh, it wasn't a flower; it was done flowering. But then, just next to the pines and the. Um, uh, Hello, Chrisham here, the formiums and barberries, just the colors were spectacular and textures. And then I went, this was right across from the, the Ogden Point breakwater, and I walked down this. this it's a pretty long breakwater. It's pretty cool, though, so we'll go on here. That was just for reference. So um, this is some of the breakwater. They've had, someone had gone and painted murals on it, but this is just part of it. Uh, I ran into a couple while I was walking down this. From um, they were from Calgary. They have a place here in Victoria, and then they spend their winters in Florida. And I said, "Oh, if you if you're coming back through, or they drive from Calgary to Florida." I said, "If you come through North Carolina, stop by." So uh, talked to them for about 15 minutes before I walked out. So there's a little lighthouse right there. So uh, I think now oh, I must not have put the lighthouse in there. But I looked at some of the the critters as I went along. This is one of the um, jellyfish I saw. I saw several starfish, and this is. Uh, on one of the starfish, and I just read an article like the week after, a week or two after we were back. That there's something that's killing these now, so um, those can get up to three feet across. That one, is, I'm going to guess, is probably 12 or uh, 15 inches. And our very last stop for some of us was going back to Bouchard Gardens for their evening lighting, and it's called Night Illuminations, and they light up the whole entire garden. Uh, which was a very hard to photograph, unfortunately. So I don't have too many to share with you. But this is uh, uh, close to sunset, which is some of the lights turning on. And they offer a nightly concert out on the lawn uh, throughout the entire summer. And here's just a few uh, quick uh, garden scenes. Here's the star pond at night and uh, some of the dahlias. And uh, just a nice statue in the Italian garden, which we didn't see earlier. And just a nice uh, uh, planting of um, uh, annuals. And that's the whole show. We uh, headed back to Raleigh and...